The Secret of the Growing Gold by Bram Stoker When Margaret Delandre went to live at Brent's Rock, the whole neighborhood awoke to the pleasure of an entirely new scandal. Scandals in connection with either the Delandre family or the Brents of Brent's Rock were not few, and if the secret history of the county had been written in full, both names would have been found well represented. It is true that the status of each was so different that they might have belonged to different continents, or to different worlds, for the matter of that, for hitherto their orbits had never crossed. The Brents were accorded by the whole section of the county a unique social dominance, and had ever held themselves as high above the yeoman class to which Margaret Delandre belonged as a blue-blooded Spanish hidalgo outtops his peasant tenantry. The Delandres had an ancient record, and were proud of it in their way, as the Brents were of theirs. But the family had never risen above yeomanry, and although they had been once well-to-do in the good old times of foreign wars and protection, their fortunes had withered under the scorching of the free trade sun and the piping times of peace. They had, as the elder members used to assert, stuck to the land, with the result that they had taken root in it, body and soul. In fact, they, having chosen the life of vegetables, had flourished as vegetation does, blossomed and thrived in the good season, and suffered in the bad. Their holding, Danders Croft, seemed to have been worked out, and to be typical of the family which had lived in it. The latter had declined, generation after generation, sending out now and again some abortive shoot of unsatisfied energy in the shape of a soldier or sailor, who had worked his way to the minor grades of the services, and had there stopped, cut short either from unheeding gallantry in action, or from that destroying cause to men without breeding or youthful care, the recognition of a position above them which they feel unfitted to fill. So, little by little, the family dropped lower and lower, the men brooding and dissatisfied and drinking themselves into the grave, the women drudging at home or marrying beneath them, or worse. In process of time, all disappeared, leaving only two in the croft, Wickham Delandre and his sister Margaret. The man and woman seemed to have inherited in masculine and feminine form, respectively, the evil tendency of their race sharing in common the principles, though manifesting them in different ways, of sullen passion, voluptuousness, and recklessness. The history of the Brents had been something similar, but showing the causes of decadence in their aristocratic and not their plebeian forms. They, too, had sent their shoots to the wars, but their positions had been different, and they had often attained honor, for without flaw they were gallant, and brave deeds were done by them before the selfish dissipation which marked them had sapped their vigor. The present head of the family, if family it could now be called when one remained of the direct line, was Geoffrey Brent. He was almost a type of worn-out race, manifesting in some ways its most brilliant qualities, and in others its utter degradation. He might be fairly compared with some of those antique Italian nobles whom the painters have preserved to us with their courage, their unscrupulousness, their refinement of lust and cruelty, the voluptuary actual with the fiendish potential. He was certainly handsome, with that dark, aquiline, commanding beauty which women so generally recognize as dominant. With men he was distant and cold, but such a bearing never deters womankind. The unscrutable laws of sex are so arranged that even a timid woman is not afraid of a fierce and haughty man. And so it was that there was hardly a woman of any kind or degree who lived within view of Brent's Rock, who did not cherish some form of secret admiration for the handsome wastrel. The category was a wide one, for Brent's Rock rose up steeply from the midst of a level region, and for a circuit of a hundred miles it lay on the horizon, with its high old towers and steep roofs cutting the level edge of wood and hamlet and far-scattered mansions. So long as Geoffrey Brent confined his dissipations to London and Paris and Vienna, anywhere out of sight and sound of his home, opinion was silent. It is easy to listen to far-off echoes unmoved, and we can treat them with disbelief, or scorn, or disdain, or whatever attitude of coldness may suit our purpose. But when the scandal came close to home it was another matter, and the feelings of independence and integrity which is in people of every community, which is not utterly spoiled, asserted itself and demanded that condemnation should be expressed. Still, there was a certain reticence in all and no more notice was taken of the existing facts than was absolutely necessary. Margaret de Londra bore herself so fearlessly and so openly, she accepted her position as the justified companion of Geoffrey Brent so naturally, that people came to believe that she was secretly married to him, and therefore thought it wiser to hold their tongues, lest time should justify her, and also make her an active enemy. 
the one person who by his interference could have settled all doubts was debarred by circumstances from interfering in the matter wickham delandre had quarrelled with his sister or perhaps it was that she had quarrelled with him and they were on terms not merely of armed neutrality but of bitter hatred the quarrel had been antecedent to margaret going to brent's rock she and wickham had almost come to blows there had certainly been threats on one side and on the other and in the end wickham overcome with passion had ordered his sister to leave his house she had risen straight away and without waiting to pack up even her own personal belongings had walked out of the house on the threshold she had paused for a moment to hurl a bitter threat at wickham that he would ruin shame and despair to the last hour of his life his act of that day some weeks had since passed and it was understood in the neighbourhood that margaret had gone to london when she suddenly appeared driving out with geoffrey brent and the entire neighbourhood knew before nightfall that she had taken up her abode at the rock it was no subject of surprise that brent had come back unexpectedly for such was his usual custom even his own servants never knew when to expect him for there was a private door of which he alone had the key by which he sometimes entered without anyone in the house being aware of his coming this was his usual method of appearing after a long absence wickham delandre was furious at the news he vowed vengeance and to keep his mind level with his passion drank deeper than ever he tried several times to see his sister but she contemptuously refused to meet him he tried to have an interview with brent and was refused by him also then he tried to stop him in the road but without avail for geoffrey was not a man to be stopped against his will several actual encounters took place between the two men and many more were threatened and avoided at last wickham de Londra settled down to a morose vengeful acceptance of the situation neither margaret nor geoffrey was of a pacific temperament and it was not long before there began to be quarrels between them one thing would lead to another and wine flowed freely at brent's rock now and again the quarrels would assume a bitter aspect and threats would be exchanged in uncompromising language that fairly awed the listening servants but such quarrels generally ended where domestic altercations do in reconciliation and in a mutual respect for the fighting qualities proportionate to their manifestation fighting for its own sake is found by a certain class of persons all the world over to be a matter of absorbing interest and there is no reason to believe that domestic conditions minimize its potency geoffrey and margaret made occasional absences from brent's rock and on each of these occasions wickham de Londra also absented himself but as he generally heard of the absence too late to be of any service he returned home each time in a more bitter and discontented frame of mind than before at last there came a time when the absence from brent's rock became longer than before only a few days earlier there had been a quarrel exceeding in bitterness anything which had gone before but this too had been made up and a trip on the continent had been mentioned before the servants after a few days wickham de Londra also went away and it was some weeks before he returned it was noticed that he was full of some new importance satisfaction exaltation they hardly knew how to call it he went straight away to brent's rock and demanded to see geoffrey brent and on being told that he had not yet returned said with a grim decision which the servants noted i shall come again my news is solid it can wait and turned away week after week went by and month after month and then there came a rumour certified later on that an accident had occurred in the zermatt valley whilst crossing a dangerous pass the carriage containing an english lady and the driver had fallen over a precipice the gentleman of the party mr geoffrey brent having been fortunately saved as he had been walking up the hill to ease the horses he gave information and a search was made the broken rail the excoriated roadway the marks where the horses had struggled on the decline before finally pitching over into the torrent all told the sad tale it was a wet season and there had been much snow in the winter so that the river was swollen beyond its usual volume and the eddies of the stream were packed with ice all search was made and finally the wreck of the carriage and the body of one horse were found in an eddy of the river later the body of the driver was found on the sandy torrent-swept waste near tosh but the body of the lady like that of the other horse had quite disappeared and was what was left of it by that time whirling amongst the eddies of the rhone on its way down to the lake of geneva wickham de Londres made all the inquiries possible but could not find any trace of the missing woman he found, however, in the books of the various hotels the name of Mr. and Mrs. Geoffrey Brent, and he had a stone erected at Zermatt to his sister's memory, under her married name, 
and a tablet put up in the church at Breton, the parish in which both Brent's Rock and Dandercroft were situated. There was a lapse of nearly a year after the excitement of the matter had worn away, and the whole neighborhood had gone on its accustomed way. Brent was still absent, and Delandre more drunken, more morose, and more revengeful than before. Then there was a new excitement. Brent's Rock was being made ready for a new mistress. It was officially announced by Geoffrey himself, in a letter to the vicar, that he had been married some months before to an Italian lady, and that they were then on their way home. Then a small army of workmen invaded the house, and hammer and plane sounded, and a general air of size and paint pervaded the atmosphere. One wing of the old house, the south, was entirely redone, and then the great body of the workmen departed, leaving only materials for the doing of the old hall when Geoffrey Brent should have returned, for he had directed that the decoration was only to be done under his own eyes. He had brought with him accurate drawings of a hall in the house of his bride's father, for he wished to reproduce for her the place to which she had been accustomed. As the moulding had all to be redone, some scaffolding poles and boards were brought in and laid on one side of the great hall, and also a great wooden tank or box for mixing the lime, which was laid in bags beside it. When the new mistress of Brent's Rock arrived, the bells of the church rang out, and there was a general jubilation. She was a beautiful creature, full of the poetry and fire and passion of the South, and the few English words which she had learned were spoken in such a sweet and pretty broken way that she won the hearts of the people almost as much by the music of her voice as by the melting beauty of her dark eyes. Geoffrey Brent seemed more happy than he had ever before appeared, but there was a dark, anxious look on his face that was new to those who knew him of old, and he started at times as though at some noise that was unheard by others. And so months passed, and the whisper grew that at last Brent's rock was to have an heir. Geoffrey was very tender to his wife, and the new bond between them seemed to soften him. He took more interest in his tenants and their needs than he had ever done and works of charity on his part as well as on his sweet young wife's were not lacking. He seemed to have set all his hopes on the child that was coming, and as he looked deeper into the future, the dark shadow that had come over his face seemed to die gradually away. All the time Wickham Delandre nursed his revenge. Deep in his heart had grown up a purpose of vengeance, which only waited an opportunity to crystallize and take a definite shape. His vague idea was somehow centered in the wife of Brent, for he knew that he could strike him best through those he loved, and the coming time seemed to hold in its womb the opportunity for which he longed. One night he sat alone in the living room of his house. It had once been a handsome room in its way, but time and neglect had done their work, and it was now little better than a ruin, without dignity or picturesqueness of any kind. He had been drinking heavily for some time, and was more than half stupefied. He thought he heard a noise, as of someone at the door, and looked up. Then he called half-savagely to come in, but there was no response. With a muttered blasphemy, he renewed his potations. Presently he forgot all around him, sank into a daze, but suddenly awoke to see, standing before him, someone, or something, like a battered, ghostly edition of his sister. 